Brilliant, hello, thank you very much. It's my first in-person talk since the pandemic, so it's quite exciting. I feel a bit nervous, actually. Okay, so one of my summer projects was finishing editing a collection of essays on panpsychism with contributions by scientists as well as philosophers. Scientists, for example, Carlo Ravelli and Sean Carroll and Lee Smolin and Anil Seth, who were, who were here. Uh, and I was, my original plan was to talk through a lot of these essays and sort of discuss them, but I realized that would just take too long. So what I've decided to do is just focus on two critiques of panpsychism by theoretical physicists. One by uh, Sabine, Hossen, Sabine Hossenfelder, which, which wasn't in the volume actually, it was a, a blog post from a couple of years ago that got quite a lot of attention, and one that is in the volume by Sean Carroll. So that's the first thing I want to do. I want to show how I respond to those critiques, show how I think they don't really work against panpsychism in the way they intend to. And then the second part of thing I want to do towards the end is just to connect this to broader issues in the science of consciousness. I want to suggest that the considerations that come up in responding to these, to these critiques point the way, a possible way forward for the science of consciousness, a way of overcoming a deep difficulty at the heart of the science of consciousness that we've been wrestling with for at least 150 years. And incidentally, if anyone's interested, a lot, a lot, of, the volu a lot of the essays are already online, and I've got a a link to them all from my, my horribly titled blog, Conscience and Consciousness, which is a really bad name, but which is also linked to from my website if anyone's interested. Okay, so just a quick introduction to panpsychism. We're going to sort of clarify it more as, as the talk goes on. But it's basically the view that consciousness is a fundamental and ubiquitous feature of the physical world. It doesn't necessarily mean that literally everything is conscious. The, the basic commitment is that the fundamental building blocks of reality, perhaps fundamental particles like electrons and quarks, have incredibly simple forms of experience, and that the very complex experience of the human or animal brain is somehow derived from the very simple experience of the brain's most basic parts. Okay, so straight on with the critique. So Sabina Hossenfelder has argued that there is inevitably a clash between panpsychism and the standard model. That what is the standard model? This is our best theory of uh, fundamental particles. It postulates 25 particles and characterizes them in terms of three of the four known forces, electromagnetism, weak and strong nuclear force. And Sabina's thought is, well look, the standard model characterizes particles in terms of physical properties like mass, charge, spin. If particles also had these weird non-physical consciousness properties, presumably that would affect their behavior, and we'd have predictions that differ from the predictions of the standard model, because the standard model just predicts their behavior on the basis of their physical properties. So we'd end up with a clash. The standard model is very well confirmed, so we should reject panpsychism. Okay, it's a very intuitive thought, I think. The problem is, I think Sabina just misunderstands the view, or at least She's not talking about the kind of panpsychism that has been much discussed in contemporary philosophy, which, which has become known as Russellian panpsychism, so-called because it was inspired by certain things Bertrand Russell wrote in the 1920s. So I'll, I'd like to talk a little bit more about this. So, so the problem is Sabina's thinking of um, panpsychism in dualist terms. And a, a lot of people do think that. It's a kind of natural way. So you think like the electron has its physical properties like mass and charge, and also these non-physical consciousness properties. But that's not the view of the Rossellian panpsychist. The view of the Rossellian panpsychist is that the physical properties of mass, spin, and charge are forms of consciousness. That is the view. Sounds kind of weird at first. How, do, how on earth do we make sense of that? So let's talk a little bit more about, spell out a bit more this Rossellian panpsychist view. So the starting point, it, Russell's kind of insight was that physics tells you less than you might have thought about the nature of reality. In the public mind, we have this idea that physics is giving us this rich story of the nature of space and time and matter. But actually, when you actually look at the information we're getting from physics, it's really all about what stuff does. It's about behavior, right? Physics tells us particles have mass and spin and charge, and these properties are completely characterized in terms of what they do. Mass is characterized in terms of gravitational attraction and resistance to acceleration. 
charge, in terms of attraction and repulsion. This is all about what these properties do in the sense of how they dispose particles to behave. Interesting philosophical question. Does this information about the behavior of mass tell us anything about the nature of mass? To put it another way, what is the connection between the nature of mass and its behavior? Well, there are broadly speaking two philosophical camps here. Dispositional essentialism, represented for example by Barbara Vetter here, or my colleague Stephen Mumford. Do they think the nature of mass is just defined by what it does? Once you know everything there is to know about what mass does, you know what mass is. But an equally popular view, quidditism, sounds a little bit Harry Potter, but don't worry about that, represented by the late great philosopher king David Lewis here. Uh, according to this view, the nature of mass is not defined by what it does. This view makes a sharp distinction between what mass does and what it is. Okay, so there are various arguments back and forth. Uh, between these two views, I happen to think the first one is incoherent. I've tried to press a line of argument from Russell for that, but you know we can take them roughly to be e equal possible metaphysical options. And the panpsychist goes for the quidditist option. So the nature of mass is distinct from its behavior. But if you go for this quidditism option, there's, there's a question, you know, what is the nature of mass? We can't look to physics, might sound surprising that you can't look to physics, but physics is just telling you what it does. And on this view, that's distinguished from what it is. So we end up with a kind of gap, a kind of hole in our scientific story of the universe. So the genius of Russell in the analysis of matter in 1927 was to put consciousness in that hole. Right? We, we struggle to find a place for consciousness in our scientific picture of the world. We've got this hole. Maybe we can put consciousness in the hole. So on the, uh, the Russellian panpsychist extension of this, which is not quite the view Russell held, but it's closely related, mass just is a very simple form of consciousness. Physics tells you what it does, but in terms of what it is, it's a, it's a very elementary form of consciousness. So on this view, when you're doing physics, you are st studying forms of consciousness. You don't know that's what you're doing, because when you're doing physics, you're just interested in behavior. I, I sometimes put it, you know, when you're doing physics, it's like playing chess, when you're just interested in what the pieces do. You're not interested in what they're made of. But nonetheless, unbeknownst to you, that, that is what you're doing. So I think once, once we realize that this is what the view is, I think Sabina's position just doesn't hit target, because she's assuming that, you know, everything the particle does is determined by the, the properties of the standard model. That's what the panpsychist thinks. Right? They just have a different metaphysical, philosophical theory of the nature of those properties. They think they're forms of consciousness. Whereas Sabina talks about the standard model, Sean focuses on the core theory, which is the standard model combined with the weak field limit of general relativity. So you may know that there's this difficulty reconciling general relativity, our best theory of big things, and quantum mechanics, our best theory of little things. But as I understand it, I'm not a physicist, um, the, the clash only arises in certain non-terrestrial circumstances like inside a black hole or something. We have very high gravity. For the, the, the matter in ordinary, in bodies and brains, we can actually bring quantum mechanics and general relativity together by just taking the standard model and the weak field limit of, of general relativity. So Sean Carroll thinks we should have great confidence that we do now already have the complete and final um, physical theory of the matter in bodies and brains. And then his thought is, well, look, if consciousness is a fundamental property having an impact on the brain, this will result in brains doing things not predicted by the core theory, because the core theory doesn't talk about consciousness. So it's a bit like Sabina's objection, but at the level of brains rather than particles. OK, well, in responding to this, let's look at a little bit more detail into panpsychism. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.